Today, I have the pleasure on Critical Material Corner to discuss copper. So why don't we start with Byron King? Copper, is it a critical material? And where is the copper market today? Well, absolutely, it's a critical material. If you don't have some, get some. Um, you know, for all the obvious reasons, I mean, there's the, there's just the natural progression of world industry, but, uh, you know, the whole environmental side of things, you know, more electricity, more electric cars, more everything. Copper, copper is big, copper is getting bigger. Demand generally, I mean, this is global, we have limited time, but, you know, demand is rising. Supply from the old mines, the old big mines down in Chile, and, you know, that's all starting to taper off. Um, ESG, the whole environmental sustainability governance, that's very critical to any company anymore. If you're not doing it right, you're, you're not going to do it. And then in general, the world is dividing up into a multipolar world. This isn't the globalized world of 10 and 12 or 20 years ago. You know, uh, you know the, there's the China block, the China-Russia block, if you want to get there. There's the Western block. Things that people in the West thought that they used to just be able to wave some money and they'll buy it. That's not going to be the case in the future. So where is your deposit and where, how do you plan to get it? In general, we're looking at a strong copper market. And, and if you can't figure that out, I don't know what else to tell you. Let's move on to other important things, though, because we have a great guest today. Okay, I agree with you, Byron. And so, Jack, if you'd like to add anything, since you are the critical material expert globally, um, and also, can you add whether or not the copper supply will meet the demand in this decade? Okay, well, the second one is easy. No. Uh, because if we're going to electrify transportation, I agree with Byron, by the way, that we're becoming a regional, even an individual national market for all metals. If, if you assume that the United States would be making all of its cars as EV electric, battery electric in the year 2030, it would require 17 million times 100 uh, pounds of copper per new car, per electric car. Um, that turns out, I've, <clears throat> I've done the math, that turns out to be about a million ton, new tons of copper. Because the U.S. market today, it, it, we produce about 2,000 tons of copper a year. We use about 2,000 tons of copper a year. So as, and, and oh, some of it's recycled. But as we add housing, cars, buildings, we're tying up copper, especially in homes. Typical American home has a quarter ton of copper, and that's not recycled for 50 to 75 years. So it's gone. America needs to be self-sufficient in copper. Right now, it's on the cusp. These new projects are going, to, are going to put us in deficit. The world's in deficit. We're going to be in deficit also. That's my uh, opinion. And of course, we have Claudia Tornquist from Kodiak Copper. I'm sure you have some comments from both Byron's answers and Jack's answers. Would you like to, to, to just start there? Sure. In my, from my perspective, the um, copper supply side is particularly striking. I mean, the demand, I think, is widely, widely seen by market commentators as just exploding, not just for copper, but also for other battery metals, green metals, etc., but in copper in particular, if you look at the supply side, the picture is really stark. In the last 10 years, there have only been four major discoveries of more than a billion pounds of, of copper. And more copper was discovered in the single year in 1991 than in the last decade. And that simply is a function of the world coming off an extended period of low commodity prices and no money being spent on exploration. So at this point, we are faced with a supply pipeline of projects that are being developed, future copper supply that is at an all time low. Byron, would you like to add anything to Claudia's answer? Uh, I'd reinforce the part about, you know, several decades of under exploration and under investment. I mean, the world was just coasting along. If you look at the average age of the copper deposits that the world relies on, you're looking at big numbers, 50, 60, 70 years. 
the, certain of the copper deposits that have, have supplied the world, where they were discovered in the 1880s, the early 1900s, the 1920s, and we're still we're still in, we're still pulling copper out. But these are played out mines. They're very deep. The grade is low. Uh, all sorts of legacy, industrial, and environmental problems, uh, jurisdictional location problems. You know, water problems, labor problems. Um, the world the world needs a refresh. Uh, which is why it is just uh, critical that we see, you know, truly brilliant new projects coming through the pipeline, like Kodiak Copper, to name at least one name out of, you know, a, out of a list. But we're so fortunate to have Claudia here today to tell us about her project. I'd like to ask Claudia a question. Uh, I'm going to preface it with some information. In Arizona and Alaska, the U.S. government, in its brilliance, has stopped dead two large copper projects, both of which were backed by global uh, mining groups. And it's very frustrating because this, this is the climate we live in. It, it, we need copper and our government doesn't seem to understand it. What, where are you with getting permission to, to build your mine? I think you hit on a, on a very important point in that jurisdiction and where your project is, is becoming more and more important. And I hear from many investors who really like where our project is located, BC, for reasons of obviously um, just permits and, and ease of, of um, access, but also very much the whole ESG side of things, which is becoming more and more important to investors. Investors just look for um, projects that tick the boxes that are um, accepted by the local communities where the whole um, stakeholder and, and indigenous and community relations side works that have local support. They're looking for projects that are taking care of the environment. All these angles are becoming more and more important. And so investors really look where is a project located. So with that, and further to Jack's uh, question, can you tell us how Kodiak's project and how it will contribute to, North, to the North American supply chain? Look, we were fortunate at Kodiak to make a porphyry discovery. Just over a year ago, we drilled into a high-grade zone called the Gate Zone at our MPD project in Southern British Columbia. And we have this year, just completed actually a large drill program of 22,000 meters and built onto this initial discovery and drilled a lot more high grade mineralization and have now um, almost a kilometer in, in length across 350 meters down to 800 meters. So significant volume um, of high grade mineralization, copper mineralization that we have drilled. And so fantastic progress, we're very pleased, but of course, lots more to come because porphyries like the one we are exploring at, at Kodiak are large deposits, that's why we like them. And it also means, and that's where it ties back into the whole supply story. It takes a while to really drill them, develop them because they can grow into mines that then produce for decades. And if you don't have a discovery now of a porphyry, then you know in 10 years time, there won't be a mine because simply there is a long time span. So that's why it's all the more important to yeah, explore now so that um, um, when this, this supply gap really, um, really opens up in the second half of this decade, um, there is some no, new supply on the horizon. I think Byron, you wanted to ask a question, didn't you? I do. Yes, thank you, uh, Claudia. You are, uh, you're 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 bringing us to a to a very important point, not just for your project but for investors in general. That you know, you don't just go out and, and find a mine. You know, you, you, these things take decades in some respects to develop. Your particular project in British Columbia has been let's say prospected for many decades. I mean, there are a lot of people who drilled a lot of holes, kicked a lot of rocks before your team came along. Um, 
your team though went from prospecting more to exploring. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you had to do to get past the prospecting and into the exploration side of of, of finding the deposit that you're that you're building there? Yeah, that's a good question, and it has a somewhat interesting answer. The MPD project where we made our discovery has been, as you said, been explored for decades, since the 60s, and many different companies have drilled it at different points in time. And they found some good copper and gold near surface, but nobody really cracked the system. And what we did differently, and kudos really there goes to Chris Taylor, our chairman, who is a very creative, out of the box thinking geologist. He went um, and he did exactly what he did with our sister company, Great Bear, which is a fantastic success for him. He looked at the project that other people had explored and just interpreted it in a different way, took a different approach and made it a big success. We did that with Great Bear and Kodiak is a similar story in that Chris's interpretation of the historic work was that all the drilling simply wasn't deep enough. And his view, his exploration thesis was that the high grade zones can be found at greater depth. So we drilled deeper and had success right off the bat. We made the first discovery hole in our first maiden drill program and it's been onwards and upwards from there. Look, can I just bring one more point here that, you know, when in, in the in the olden days, you know, people would drill 100 meters, 200 meters, you know, when you when you start to drill 500 and 600 and 800 meters, the, the cash register really starts to ring. Those are expensive holes. And so what was your trick or what was your secret to financing, uh, you know, a, a, a large number of deeper holes on that? Tell us, tell the viewers out there what, what you had to do to make that happen. Well, our first discovery hole, high-grade discovery hole, generated quite some excitement in the market. And we then had a large resource company, Tech Resources, mm -hmm. uh, join our shareholder register, invest $8 million in our company, become the 9.9 .9, or take up 9.9% .9 of our shares. That enabled us to raise $12 million that funded this year's big drill program. And of course, again, was received very well by the market because if a big company such as Tech shows interest in a project and puts not an insignificant investment into a company that shows that they think they have the potential, this can be big. Tech is a big company, they're not interested in small projects. Mm -hmm. And it was a great vote of confidence in our project. And we were very um, glad to welcome them as a major shareholder, they're a fantastic partner. Let, let me ask one last question. What is it you're planning to sell? Are you gonna to go to blister copper, anode copper? What is, what is the product going to be from your mind? Look, at this stage, we're an exploration project and we are all about discovery. What we know is that we have a large porphyry system on our hands. And um, that's, I think, what the, the future potential is to build a big porphyry mine, just like the ones in the uh, vicinity. We are between Copper Mountain to our south and Highland Valley to our north, two large copper mines, which I think paint a picture of what the potential is um, for Kodiak's MPD project. I, I'm sorry, all I, all I meant was, depending on what your ore is, it, it means what you can make. If certain impurities prohibit the production of wire and wire is going to be the big product in, in future. Anyway, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and I'm very glad to see that North America is entering a, a new era, hopefully, of making, of, of producing sufficient copper so we can move forward. Uh, and I think your project is very likely to, to help that situation. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. And, and thank you for pointing out that your chairman, Chris Taylor, is very involved with Kodiak Copper. And of course, we have resource expert Byron King and critical materials expert Jack Lipton. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Claudia. Appreciate it from Kodiak Copper. <laughs>